We're starting back in our study of Mark at chapter 10. And this is a redo because for some reason the microphone wasn't on when I preached this sermon on Sunday. So we're redoing it. That's why there's no one here in the auditorium. But I thought this message was so important that I wanted to redo it so you could hear the Bible's perspective and what we teach here at Community Church of the Hills. This is Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce. It is at Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. We've been going through the book of Mark, and we're here. He's now heading towards Jerusalem, and all along the way to his final destination, he is teaching people as is his custom. So this is where we are at. This is where Jesus talks about God's standard for marriage and divorce. This is a topic that's quite relevant since the very definition of marriage has been redefined, as we all know, in 2018, in 2017, in 2016. It all started back, in fact, way back, but I remember specifically in 2008 when there was the great marriage debate in California and uh, that proposition got overturned even though it was the will of the people to keep the definition of marriage between one man and one woman. And the attitudes that the people had regarding divorce in Jesus' day were, well, about the same as they are today. That's why I think this is such a relevant topic. So this teaching will bring it all back into perspective as we learn God's radical view of marriage. Now, I'm using the term radical in its primary definition relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something. So we're going back to the fundamentals of this teaching on marriage and divorce. So let's read from Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man... She commits adultery. Thus says the word of the Lord. I want to acknowledge pastors John MacArthur, Jim Baumkamp, and Brian Bill for this teaching. They were a great source of information, and I borrowed quite liberally from them. So the setting. Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem, where he'll ultimately be crucified. The crowds are following, and he teaches them. Along with the crowds, though, are those Pharisees. You remember them, right? They are the religious hypocrites who do not practice what they preach. Everything Jesus teaches is 180 degrees opposite of what these hypocritical religious teachers taught the people. You can guarantee that whatever they thought, Jesus thought different and vice versa. They taught that everyone needed to follow the rules Not God's rules necessarily, but their own man-made rules. Rules that they didn't even follow. It's not unlike all all the hypocrisy that is currently going on within Christianity concerning all the sex scandals right now, Catholic and Protestant, where major church leaders do not practice what they preach, and they have committed a grievous sin against the people of God. But these guys... These Pharisees hate Jesus and tried to trip him up whenever they could. 
So they asked him this question. Verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now they weren't really concerned where Jesus stood on the issue. They're trying to get him to say something to incriminate himself that will either get him killed or imprisoned. How? Well, this is the area where John the Baptist got his head cut off for challenging King Herod's marriage violation when he divorced his own spouse and married his brother's wife. You remember that sordid little incident, don't you? If Jesus con condemns divorce in this region, then he will risk the same fate as John the Baptist because word would get back to King Herod that another prophet is ragging on him about his divorce. Now, if he condones divorce, then he would lose the confidence of those who believed in him, all of his followers. There is nothing that the Pharisees would like better than to discredit Jesus in the eyes of his followers. So, what does Jesus do? It apparently seems that he's stuck on the horns horns of a dilemma. If he does this, it's wrong. If he does this, it's wrong. If he says, it's unlawful for you to divorce your wife, he'll be in trouble. If he condones, if he condones divorce, he'll be in trouble. Now in Jesus' day, divorce was very common and there were two schools of thought regarding it. One was very liberal, the other strict. The liberal view came from a prominent rabbi named Hillel. Men would and could divorce their wives for any reason. I know, not so different than today. But if a man, this is religious, this is re religious Israel, remember, or not so religious, if you will. If a man didn't like his wife's cooking, if she burnt the toast, for instance, he could immediately divorce her for this. Or if she let someone see her ankles or letting her hair down, making a negative comment about her mother-in-law. Or if none of those things happened, a man could divorce his wife if he found someone else he preferred over her. The strict view now was by Rabbi Shammai. The only time, the only time he taught that a man could divorce his wife is if he discovered she wasn't a virgin after he married her. You remember the same situation with Joseph and Mary. Obviously, the liberal view was the more popular view. Well, at least among men. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, they asked. If Jesus answers yes, he'd be in trouble. If he answered no, he'd be in trouble. Quite a dilemma, huh? Well, not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. He did not give a hoot what the people at that time would think is politically correct. He did not give the politically correct answer. Jesus wasn't politically correct. Jesus was just correct. Here are what the top marriage counselors of the Bible had to say, according to Jesus. You know them. Moses, God, the Father, of course, Jesus, and then what Jesus didn't say, but what the Apostle Paul said. Let's start with, this is what Moses said. Jesus ignored the current debates and focused the attention on the Word of God. That sounds something that's quite apropos for today, wouldn't you agree? He focused his attention on the Word of God, so he took them first to Moses, because the Pharisees considered Moses their highest authority. Verse 3, what did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Oh, really? Well, the Pharisees are referring to Deuteronomy 24, 1, which states, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, well, that's what happens. That's the implication. She gets a certificate of divorce and he sends her from her house. Moses had permitted a man to legally divorce his wife by only, only by writing up a divorce decree document. 
after the decree was submitted, the man and woman were no longer considered to be married, and then they could remarry. This was a legal process. This took some effort. This wasn't cut and dried. This was not, if you will, a Las Vegas divorce. A woman who was divorced, who did not have this decree, would become a social outcast, and no man could marry her. She would be left defenseless and destitute. The marriage laws were all on the man's side. Moses permitted this divorce decree to provide some protection for women so men could not just impulsively divorce their wives for any reason. Moses was not encouraging divorce, but trying to discourage it by putting a few roadblocks in the way. This was not the original plan designed by God, but a concession to man's sinfulness, mostly to protect the women. Do you see how the Pharisees perverted it? The marriage of one man to one woman for life is the foundation of a stable society. That's why Jesus replied, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law in verse 5. Okay, well, let's see what God said about this. Jesus quoted Moses and explained his original intention. Now he reminds the Pharisees of God's original plan, verses 6 through 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let's start with at the beginning. Jesus went back to Moses, then he went back to the first marriage where God made the rules. In these four verses, Jesus shows the truth of what God planned for marriage, the difference, the severance, and the permanence. Here's the difference. God made them male and female. There are only two genders, two sexes, not the 58 or 68 or 112 the internet says there is, only two, male and female. Despite the fact that our country has made marriage a legal institution between anyone of the same sex, Jesus points out that marriage is only to be between a man and a woman, no exceptions. It can never be anything else. You can call this pulpit a refrigerator, but it is not. Everyone can look at it and acknowledge it as a refrigerator, but it's not. It's a pulpit. You can call marriage between two men a marriage, and it's not. You can call a union between two women a marriage, and it's not. It's between a man and a woman only. God made the definition. He set the standards. There's only one type of marriage between one man and one woman. Now comes the severance. The healthy goal of the parent is to prepare the child to leave the home, not stay. A different relationship starts up on the wedding day. There's also a change in authority. The new husband goes from a father's son to the headship of his own home. The wife no longer has to submit to her parents, but now submits to her husband's leadership. You talk about another unpopular notion. Can you understand at all why society is throwing off the, quote, shackles of the patriarchy and throwing off everything the Bible taught? But this is everything that creates a stable, peaceful home. Then there's the permanence. Simply put, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Marriage is between one man and one woman for life. Okay, we heard what Moses said. We heard what God said. This is what Jesus said. All of this is what Jesus said, but this is what he said about marriage in verses 10 through 12. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, 
she commits adultery. In stark contrast to what the religious leaders taught, Jesus reaffirms that marriage should last forever, with one exception, adultery, when the marriage vows are broken by another man or woman outside the marriage. Now, Matthew 19, 19, Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Matthew was covering the Jewish mindset. A man could divorce a woman, but a woman couldn't divorce a man. Mark is covering the Greek mindset. So he includes the woman being able to divorce the man. Again, for the same reason, adultery. Jesus gives God's intention that marriage should be a permanent commitment. He spoke in these terms to discourage all divorce in principle, but not to prohibit divorce in every circumstance. Jesus adds this because in Old Testament times, adultery wasn't grounds for divorce. It was grounds for getting stoned to death. Adultery doesn't make divorce necessary or required, but simply permits it. What's the greater good? Forgiveness. If your spouse has committed adultery on you, sure, you can hold them to the letter of the law, and divorce them, and you would be within your right. But the greater virtue is forgiveness. Look what Christ did for us. Look what we did to him. Forgive and forgive and forgive. How many times? Okay. Now this is what Paul said. We covered everything Jesus said. We covered everything God said. We heard, heard everything that Moses said. This is what Paul said. This is in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 15. This is the abandonment clause. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. If the unbeliever leaves... Let him or her leave. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. It seems that people's hearts have grown colder and colder in these current times, doesn't it? It's easy to do. It's easy to justify divorce over the smallest thing. Everything militates against a permanent marriage. Everything in this world fights against it. The sin factor is the greatest problem. There is an unavoidable conflict in marriage that may lead to divorce, hostility, that all started at the fall when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered the world. How is that played out though? Let me explain. After the fall, after the curse, the man is cursed in relation to his work. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. That's the curse in relation to the man, his work. Subject to frustration. Can't get it all done. Very few moments of gratifying labor. It's usually toil and sweat and agonizing pain and you never fully feel fulfilled. Now the woman is cursed in connection with bearing children and 
Here's the marriage issue, submitting to her husband. Genesis 3.16, to the woman God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Let's look at that last verse. The curse on the woman gives us some insight on why there is conflict in marriage. It says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, we're not referring to a woman's normal romantic, psychological, or emotional desire to her husband, since we're talking about this being part of the curse. That's not. This is. So let me explain. The Hebrew word for desire is only used once in the first five books of the Bible. In Genesis 4-7, when God warned Cain before he murdered his brother Abel, he said, sin is crouching at your door, it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The same language is used for the curse on the woman in Genesis 3.16. She will desire to control her husband is the implication, and he will have to master her. Wives, by the curse, seek to be independent of their husband's authority, to dominate the relationship and impose their will on their husbands. Husbands, on the other hand, by the same curse, seek to suppress their wives' revolt. How? They seek to, to suppress their wives' revolt against their authority, often in a harsh, ungracious, dictatorial manner. And you can see how the sparks fly. One person trying to get out of the yoke, the other person trying to put the yoke on, so to speak, in their most sinful moments. This regular conflict between two sinners living intimately together can produce animosity that leads to divorce ultimately. That's why the curse can be reversed by obeying what God said in the New Testament. Yes, we're under a curse, but in the New Testament, we're freed from the curse but we have to make the choice to do these things. Here's how to do them. Ephesians 5.21 Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. A woman submits to a man in the areas where she needs and a man submits to a woman in the areas where she needs. How does that look? Well, mutual submission is acted out in these ways. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. You got that? Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Also, Ephesians 5.33, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Those are the two things a wife needs to do. That is something that women in modern society in 2018 are ill-equipped to do. Who teaches you this, ladies? Who teaches you to submit to a husband as unto the Lord? Who teaches you to respect your husband? No, everything on television, everything in the ads, everything in society says disrespect the man. Now, granted, there are areas in which men don't need to be respected by some of the things they do. But in that household, unless the man is acting unlawfully or unbiblically or immorally, you wives are to submit to your husband as unto the Lord and respect him. Well, he doesn't deserve my respect. No, he doesn't. God commands you to respect your husband. Now, believe it or not, you have the easy part. <laughs> okay? You have the easy part. Let me tell you what the man has to do. Husbands submit to their wives by loving them as Christ loves the church and giving himself up for her. Husbands have to continually and continually and continually die to themselves. They have to love you as Christ loved the church and Christ died for the church. How does a man do that? But he's continually having to give himself up for her. And we men are selfish. Also, not only are we to give ourselves up and die to ourselves to our wives, for our wives, 
We're also called to love our wives and not to be harsh with them in Colossians 3.19. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Also, 1 Peter 3.7, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. It doesn't mean you understand them, men. It means you need to live with them in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, that only means in strength, only in strength, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, add to that sin problem. Add to that sin problem, which is enough. Add to that feminism. First wave feminism in the 70s, second wave feminism in the 90s, and now the third wave of feminism. We're not going to take it anymore. We're going to throw off the shackles of the Bible and Christianity and men. How does any marriage have a chance? Feminism has done more harm for the family than anything in the last hundred years. Feminism has ruined marriages, destroyed children, completely upended families forever. Unless, of course, one comes to Christ. Add to that the new sexual revolution and the attack on marriage as God designed, then we might as well forget it, huh? It's hopeless. It's hopeless. Marriage is hopeless unless, unless, unless. Here's the great caveat. Unless both of the married couple are following Christ closely. The only way a family has a chance is if they are a Christian family. The only way the couple has a chance is if they are following Jesus Christ closely. Paul Tripp writes, your marriage isn't what you expected because you are a sinner married to a sinner and you both live in a fallen world. I used to say, that if one person follows Jesus, the marriage will work out. I used to say that. Just one person sold out to the Lord can make that marriage work. I no longer believe that. It takes two. It takes two. Working 100%, 100% of the time. Striving with all of Christ's energy to make it work, to glorify him, to make it work. Now, you can limp along with one, but if somebody doesn't walk with the Lord anymore, and you do, and that person decides to leave, Paul says, let him leave. You can only give 100% of yourself in a marriage. When you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The good news, there is sufficient grace to bring marriages back to life, no matter how dead they've been. But when a marriage ends, let me remind you, fellow believer, the church needs to hold the teaching of God's word and show compassion for those who have failed by demonstrating God's love to those of whom we do not know all the details. We need to show compassion for those who have failed by demonstrating God's love to those of whom we don't know all the details. Marriage is very, very challenging. But I'm thankful that Christ is Lord of all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time. For whoever is watching on social media, may this be a help to them. May this be a reminder that Christ cares about marriage. May this be a reminder of what the radical notion of marriage is as taught by God, by Moses, by Jesus, by Paul. May we strive with all of our energies, 
with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life worthy of you in our marriages, in our families. And where we fall short, where we fail miserably, where we sin, let us trust Lord Jesus in your redeeming grace. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I praise you. And of course, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.